So as we stop here, let's um, take the time to discuss our paper and uh, if we have any questions about it. This paper is um, it's a paper from the <laughs> A while back, uh, about five, six years ago, but it does talk about some things that I think are interesting. One is that we talked, we were talking about square wave voltammetry previously, so we we can think about uh, we think about square wave voltammetry using it in a real system. So, does anybody have any particular questions about this paper and the results they talked about? What do they mean about the anodic stripping? Yeah, we didn't. We have never talked about that. It's um, and we will talk about it a little later. But let's give you a brief idea. Anodic stripping voltammetry or ASV. <coughs> the idea is that many metals. at a mercury cathode will be reduced um, to the metal, the metal, but then they will become dissolved in the mercury itself. So we'll form an amalgam in the uh, metal. So zinc, cadmium, lead, many metal ions will do that. Not all, but many. And uh, so the idea is for van analytic stripping voltammetry, it's an analytical method that says, let's take a dilute solution of some metal ions if we reduce that dilute solution for a fairly long period of time, what will happen is that you have a large volume of solution and a very small mercury volume. You'll get a concentration of species in the small mercury volume. So the concentration of metal in the mercury becomes much more concentrated than it is in the solution outside that. So you may not be able to physically see or the, the signal to noise ratio may be so small for trying to directly look at the current for the reduction of, of uh, the metal ion. But after a certain amount of time, you've got enough in here so that the concentration is high enough so that when you oxidize the metal ion out of the mercury electrode, you get a physically large signal. So what anionic stripping voltammetry is a, a method they call preconcentration. You can think about it in, you know, if you had a, a bucket of uh, a very dilute metal ions, and the idea would be the same as if you took that bucket of metal ions and you evaporated all the water away so that you were left with, uh, say, a few microliters of liquid at the end. And, and then, you know, by changing the volume factor by a factor of a thousand or a million, you get a, that much increase in the con concentration of your species. So the sensitivity increases by that ratio. And so you just would do uh, an oxidation to get the metal ion. Now if you did this with a voltammetry experiment, what you'd see when you did a stripping wave is that you would go, you'd be scanning positive, so you'd see a wave that would look something like this. There'd be a peak in the signal, and the peak would be reflecting the fact that you've uh, stripped out the metal ion, and because the metal ion, there's a finite amount in this small mercury drop, it can all be removed rather than a, you know, usually in diffusional systems we talk about infinite, semi-infinite conditions. Here we don't have a semi-infinite condition. We can actually physically remove all the, the metal that's in the mercury drop, and so what you see then is that you'll see a wave like this, or perhaps you might see a wave that even looks different where you see a, a very sharp, drop to zero when all the material is depleted in the metal, in the mercury. So it's a method in general for sensitive metal determination and it's a method that's very, usually very inexpensive and it's comparable in accuracy for certain metals for things like uh, um, uh, flame ionization, or not flame ionization, but atomic absorption spectroscopy and uh, ions. Uh, uh, inductively couple 
plasma methods, which are much more expensive methods. So things like people like um, oceanography, people that are measuring metal ions often use anodic stripping voltammetry because it's an inexpensive method and fits on a ship without too much trouble and things like that. You have to use, in this particular case, you know, she has to use a mercury, a mercury uh, cathode. You don't necessarily have to use it. You could plate the metal onto a solid metal electrode and that you'd do essentially the same thing. You have to make sure though that the metal is plated in a um, uniform film and then also sometimes plated metals don't really plate down as the metals. They form an oxide or something like that and it's difficult to re-oxidize it electrochemically to see the signal. So generally mercury is preferred for uh, this sort of process. What's the, um, they're using uh, mercury, they call them uh, mercury ultramicroelectrodes. What is, what's the advantage of the ultramicroelectrode uh, in, in this regard? Reduction in the, reduction in the IR drop, yeah, they do get a smaller IR drop. That's that's generally true. What's the is that really an analytical directly analytically advantageous or what's the direct analytical advantageous uh, result of it being it being small? The current would be very small. That's not really an advantage, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah. What's uh What's the what's the bottom line in any chemical analysis? Sensitivity. Yeah. Money is the bottom line in any <laughs> chemical analysis. <laughs> okay. All right. So no matter what anybody tells you, money is the bottom line. So, uh, the less money you pay to do the analysis, the better. So why why would this be a better analytical method in, in thinking about money? Materials. What do they always say about time? Oh, time is time is money, right? Yeah. So the longer longer it takes to do analysis, the, the more money you have to spend. So the technician has to be paid, lights have to be paid. You know, you can do less analysis in any given day. So time is really not just money, but it's money cubed and quadrupled. So uh, short analysis time is important for this particular method. So. So that's a, that's one of the major advantages. And so what's the, what are they doing to? So you said the IR drop that indirectly improves the time of analysis by making it, it you, you're able to actually do a shorter analysis because you reduce that. What else are they doing? Um, I guess. Did they say that they uh, the transfer rates? They can they can work in uh, they can work in in media with uh, <coughs> without supporting electrolytes. Right. That's uh, that's another advantage. They don't have to uh, modify the modify the sample by adding salt or anything like that, which could introduce its impurities of its own. Remember the problem is always going to be I have a I have a sample and it's not very concentrated metal in that sample but if I add a salt it doesn't there doesn't have to be very much contamination in that metal of a salt in that salt because now when I do the voltammetry I'm going to concentrate that impurity by the very nature of the result so you don't want to add you know, if you have to add it, you have to make very sure that it's very clean, which also adds a cost to the system. Um, um, and that has to do with all kinds of things. If you add acid or something like that to the system, it's the same thing. You have to make sure your acid's very clean, or otherwise you'll have a problem. Uh, the advantage here in the, in the preparation of the use of the reference electrode. <clears throat> it just they didn't like to use uh, 
a normal uh, carbon electrode mm -hmm. because they were afraid of some leakage. That's why they. All right. Uh, well, uh, silver, a little bit of silver and the silver silver chloride could leak out and. Yeah, they. That. They use the coated one containing no internal liquid electrolyte. Right. How, how can you prepare something like that? Lithium coated. Oh, I think. Oh, I think what it is, it's a. Oh. Well, I'm not positive. I don't know exactly what they did, but I think the idea here is you'd have a, a silver a silver wire, and you coat it with uh, silver silver or silver silver chloride silver chloride. And um, if you take that silver chloride and then you dip it in a polymer solution, you'll form a coating, very thin actually compared to that, but it would be a coating of this polymer, this it's so-called ion exclusion polymer. And the idea, I guess, would be that the, there's no external, there's no internal filling solution, but the solution that's put in would actually allow ions to go in and out and so solvent to go in and out. So there would be st still a electrical contact between those two systems that way. Yeah, so why, why is uh, chloride, they were worried about chloride contamination. What's the problem with chloride contamination in this particular experiment? What happens with uh, cadmium or copper or, or lead mm -hmm. could be deposited as chloride, especially lead that can be deposited as lead chloride. Yeah. Well, what what it would happen? Uh, what's the difference between mercury in the chloride solution and the non chloride containing solution? What's what would happen if you had? Voltammetry of mercury and chloride and non chloride containing solution. Now you might not go at this, but remember the uh, calomel electrode the, is a mercury mercury chloride system. Mm -hmm. And so chloride forms a very st stable complex with mercury. And so essentially what it does is it makes it easier to oxidize mercury because it, it can form that complex. And um, so that reduces the amount of anodic potential that you can apply by a significant amount. So any additional chloride in there would tend to add to a background signal. It may not be obvious that there's a direct oxidation of mercury, but you'd see an increased background that small amounts of chloride allow the oxidation of mercury to proceed. Um, that's a problem. What did, uh, why did they want to use, um, uh, they, well, they made a big point of the fact that this was a iridium-based mercury ultramicroelectrode. What's the advantage of the iridium? Yeah, this very, very low solubility. Yeah, why, you probably don't really know, we haven't talked about this, but do you, can you think of any reason why you'd want a low solubility of iridium? What's the advantage there? I think they mentioned something about it. It doesn't form amalgams with the, well, with the, uh, like, right. compounds that can interfere when they mix with mercury or something right. like that. Well, you're probably all pretty aware that you can say, if you put mercury and gold, you'll form an amalgam. That works out for almost every metal. It's any solid metal. If you put mercury on it, it'll form an amalgam. Platinum will form an amalgam. You know, uh, even these noble, me noble metals 
Iridium is an old metal. It forms one of the, it's one of the least amalgamating materials. And so I guess the question is why would an amalgam of platinum or mercury be a problem? Well, they, they mentioned here that the lifetime of, uh, of, of the amalgam of mercury with platinum or gold or silver is much shorter than it will be because of the formation of intermetallic compounds. Yeah. Anybody know what intermetallic compounds are? With, with an allied metal? Is that what, the, what does this mean? They react with the amylite itself. Right. That's the problem with an stripping voltammetry. The reason is, is that what you want to do is when you see these peaks coming off, they should be, they're diagnostic. So they'll strip off at different potentials depending on the redox potential of the material that you're getting. And so you want peaks at different potentials because you want to, for real samples, you might have cadmium and copper and silver, whatever in there. So you want to see different peaks. The problem is, uh, especially since you're pre-concentrating it, now the mercury has a relatively high concentration of material in the small mercury drop. And what you can find is that things like cadmium and platinum form complexes of the metals in the mercury itself. And so what happens then is that because there's a, that, because of that energy for that complex formation is there, it means that you don't get the stripping wave at the peak characteristic of cadmium alone. It's the peak, you get a characteristic for the cadmium platinum. And it turns out what it, it had a lot of bad things. It smears the waves out. They tend to clump together into one particular point. And so uh, a small amount of platinum won't have any problem, but if you put it on a small drop on a platinum electrode, you'll eventually see this problem. Iridium doesn't have that problem. Uh, and, but it actually is not just, you know, intermetallic compounds happen for analytes that you put together in one drop. So cadmium and zinc, I think, is a good example. You get cadmium and zinc intermetallic compounds, so if you're trying to analyze them together, you have some tr trouble uh, with they'll stick together. What you have to do then is make sure you don't ever build up a big enough concentration in the drop to, to significantly form this intermetallic material. Iridium is uh, useful for that. The big problem with iridium is it's so difficult to work with. You can't make small wires out of it. It's not ductile. It's also um, very hard. It, um, you can't and it's very chemically resistant as well. So they, you notice how they made the electrode is kind of um, interesting. They started with a small wire, pretty small wire, 127 micrometers diameter, but that's not small enough. They want tens of micrometers or smaller. And then they etch the wire by immersing it in a platinum crucible containing a molten salt mixture of sodium nitrate and sodium chloride at 445 degrees centigrade. So this is a, quite a reactive pot of molten salt and they have to go to that extreme to get a good etching of the, of the iridium because it's so chemically resistant otherwise. Um, is that this method is, is uh, specific for certain certain ions or it can determine different oxidation states for the same metal? Like iron 2, iron 3 or stripping voltammetry? Yeah. No, once you once you reduce the metal into the material, it's you forming your form of the metal as its metallic state. So you can't directly see the difference in the metal species. And what you'd have to do is um, do some preliminary experiments or preliminary steps to, to remove either the one form of the species and then do the other one. Um, or make it so that, for example, one of the ions can't be reduced onto the mercury by setting the initial reduction potential. You can make sure that only one ion form of the ion would be reduced and then you could strip that out, and then you could do it again with, say, both ions are reduced, and then strip that out, and then you could see that by difference what, what the things were. Iron's not a good example because it doesn't form a good amalgam with mercury, but it'd be a similar, that'd be the idea. And some ions are existing as either the free form, or they might be bound up in some other complex. So you'd have to make sure that 
particularly for things like seawater analysis, you have to go through some chemical steps, usually involving acidifying it so that all the metal ions are present in a non-complex uh, form that can be reduced at the same potential. Um, notice the uh, square wave voltammetry if you look on figure three. That's, uh, it's not, it, the square wave voltammetry is not exactly the same as the Oster-Young square wave voltammetry, but you see the forward and reverse wave and the sum waves, you see the square, and, uh, and you see that nice peak voltammogram for analysis. And now the rest of that stuff you'd not normally see, but they're showing it because they want you to they want to prove the method works, and so there's, you're seeing more than you'd normally see. Um, but then you can see in figure five, the, um, the analysis for lead and copper. In this case, they're plotting anodic currents go up instead of down. That's, that's the um, convention that they're following. Um, there is a, um, another thing that they claim as an advantage, and that was the, they didn't have to uh, remove oxygen from the system. And you notice that, why would that be a problem? Why would oxygen cause problem under some conditions? Oxygen be reduced or oxidized? Can be reduced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we had oxygen in the system and we're applying potentials that in, the, in general are, if you notice the potentials that we're looking at there is in figure five, they're negative potentials. So in that region, we're going to see a, a signal in principle for the reduction of oxygen because that's where oxygen can be reduced. And since oxygen is continuously coming in from the atmosphere from your sample cell, it's a problem, unless you specifically remove it. Now, how, in, no, under normal circumstances, you can remove oxygen in a number of ways. One way to do it is to bubble uh, purified nitrogen gas through the system, or argon, or helium sometimes. And because of the solubility, of gases and liquids, by adding a large excess of nitrogen, you can actually force the oxygen to come out of the system. And uh, the problem with that is that it adds an extra step to the analysis. When you blow the, oxygen, or the nitrogen through the system with this gas, you can sputter up and spray off some of the sample, and that causes you may be changing some, have some air in the concentration that you eventually measure. So it's not ideal. You'd right, like to avoid that removal of oxygen if you can because it makes it faster and, and less prone for to air. So why, why um, they're talking about why they, they didn't remove oxygen here. Does it, do you remember why they said they didn't need to remove it? Well, the, cork, the signals with and without removing oxygen were um, very similar right. for measuring lead and cadmium. Yeah, if you look on figure um, figure one, you can see there's really essentially no difference. And um, part of the reason for that is they've exploited the fact that oxygen is, tends to be somewhat sluggish electrochemically compared to some metal ions. So the reduction in oxidation rate constants for metal ions, especially out of a mercury amalgam, is usually very rapid, uh, particularly for copper and lead, cadmium and lead, copper and lead. And um, 
oxygen as slow. So what they're doing is they're making the experiment time frame fast enough so that the reduction of oxygen is kinetically slow and so the current for that becomes very small and you don't, you just don't see it. It's not part of the background. If you did, on the other hand, these conventional stripping voltammograms, you would see it because if usually the stripping weight is a few hundred millivolts per second or less, and uh, now it's plenty of time for oxygen to interfere with the electrochemistry. Whereas here they're doing a uh, square wave. Because we've got a small electrode, small IR drop, they can actually do high speed uh, frequency measurements or high speed measurements, and that reduces the effect of oxygen on the signal. I forget what the ones in figure one was, but. Uh, let's see, that's 100 and, uh, uh, Fifty hertz, I guess. Well, let's see. Another frequency? Yeah. Down to the well, I guess that's a that's a time to stop then. So let's stop here and uh, as I said, the next week we'll talk about. Um, some effect of the double layer capacitance and potential drop at the double layer on electrode kinetics.